Halo, halo. Halo, Kathy. Go away. Uh, one too many for everyone to join, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. We are waiting more people to join, so please bear with us for one minute. One more minute. Yeah, everybody. I think we have seventy nine people want to come, so <laughs> let's give uh, one more minute thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Cut>. <laughs> Do you want to share your screen? And then we can slowly start. Cool. I think we can start. Yeah, so Kathy, please uh, take a microphone over. Oh, sorry. So um, Kathy will continue the, um, the presentation. If you guys have any question, Please do drop the question in the text chart or we will take a question at the end of the uh, presentation. All right, so Cassie, please take over. Cool, uh, thank you, Charlie. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, folding circum circuits. Uh, I'm gonna connect it into, uh, with um, zero knowledge machine learning. Uh, hold on a second. Tyler said he can't see the screen. Is it just Tyler or does anyone else see the screen? Okay, cool. Great, then I will carry on. Um, uh, sorry, right. just, sorry, Kathy, I'm sorry. Uh, we need Tyler to see the screen because he's doing the streaming. So, all right. Um, yeah. So, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks for joining here. We're just kind of make sure. The screen is captured in the streaming, so please bear with us for one minute. Okay, we are good now. So, all right, uh, please go ahead, Kathy. Right, so as I was saying, uh, today we're gonna do a little bit of a zero knowledge machine learning CKML case study uh, while talking about folding circum circuit. Um, so the idea is that, um, well, just to set some expectation, um, we're not going to talk that much about actual zero knowledge machine learning. Um, so if you are here to learn more about ZKML, there are quite some other like recordings or videos also by me that talk more about, you know, use cases, applications, or what are the current state of ZKML. But today we are mainly focusing on like what are the actual you know practical or technical considerations when we are trying to uh, use like Nova for uh, or other like folding scheme. 
So here's the kind of rundown today. So I will start by some introduction. So I will still just so that everyone is on the same page, um, talk a little bit about what is ZKML. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the toolings that uh, I use to fold circuits, which is um, Nova Scotia. And then we're going to talk about like a um, folding scheme, uh, uh, sorry, a folding example that someone else have done in CKML, which is called Zader. So we'll get to know all about like what those are. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about technical considerations, right? So what do we fold in CKML? Uh, and then we'll talk about like, well, there are actually some issues or some considerations that I had to go through uh, while I was trying to fold like CKML operations. Uh, and then at the end, there are some numbers, uh, although incomplete, because I'm still running some simulations. Uh, and then kind of let's discuss, uh, you know, what's the next step, or I would love for everyone to chip in at the end uh, about some of the technical difficulties that I'm still having uh, right now. Right, so first of all, um, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of CKML. If you have joined any of my talks before, you'll probably, this is like maybe the 10th times you have seen this diagram and I'm sorry for that. Um, so when we talk about CKML, hold on a second, my computer just froze for some reason. Okay. Yeah, it's I, I just it, it's probably because I was still running some simulation. I shouldn't be doing that while I was sharing screen. <laughs> um, so it's back to normal now. I kind of halted the operation. I was hoping that I would get the results before I do this presentation. Uh, but anyways, so this is probably the tenth times that you have seen this diagram if you are into zkml at all. Um, so the idea is basically we are replacing the neural network, which here is abbreviated as NN, uh, by a CK circuit, right? So basically we have a CK circuit or a program that can perform what a neural network normally does. Uh, and with that, we have three types of data that goes in, right? So um, we have input data, which depends on the use case, could be, you know, an image, a prompt, or even any like tabular data, relational data, anything that you're trying to run your machine learning model on. Uh, and then we have model weights uh, at the bottom, uh, which is like uh, what is the most, probably most valuable for companies like OpenAI right nowadays. Um, you know, everyone knows that their architecture or their model is some sort of, you know, transformer model. But, uh, you know, model weights are hidden and probably more valuable than the model architecture itself. And also, uh, we have some output, right? So the output could be a prediction, a category, um, an image, if you're talking about generative art, or, um, you know, any, or, or, or um, you know, uh, some text, if you're talking about LLM. Right, and from there, we can talk about different use cases. So there are actually three types of use case. I will start with the, perhaps the most counterintuitive one, which is for everything just to be public. Uh, for those of us who have been in CK field for a while, this is probably not foreign to you, right? If we're talking about CK EVM, actually we're doing exactly the same thing. We're not using it for privacy, but we're just using it for compression. All right, so um, an example of these kind of all public use case uh, is actually a uh, ERC that I've written with some friends, 7007. Uh, it's still a draft, but the idea is you can have a provable machine learning computation. So for example, in this particular ERC is a AI generated art. So you can have verifiable, provable uh, AI generated art as your NFT uh, token. So this is the first type of use case. This is not the type that uh, we will explore later today. So I'll just quickly kind of run through. The second type is for data privacy. So you have probably heard of like having biometric authentication enabled by ZKML. And in this case, we're talking about input data being private. And that being said, uh, this is a use case that is currently a little bit less explored for multiple reasons. So first of all, machine learning model is always kind of probabilistic, right? So um, it's a little bit difficult to ensure that like your face is always gonna turn out like, if I put in my face, 
the model might not say this is Kathy every single time. Um, so this is one reason. The other reason is often like these very high performing models might be a little bit difficult to put into ZK, uh, at least for now. Uh, especially because when we talk about data privacy, we want the ZK um, prover to be operating on the client side, right? But at least for now, uh, all the actual um, machine learning models that we would desire to be used in this ZK ML use case are not possible to be run on client side um, uh, device just yet, right? So this is a type of use case that is highly desired, but um, currently not very feasible. And the third type of use case is actually what I want to do as a case study today. Uh, and that use case is a, um, the, the type when the input data is public and the model weights is private, right? So we're no longer talking about data privacy, but model pro, uh, privacy. So you can think of it as protecting the, the creator rights, right? The intellectual property of whoever uh, creates this model. Um, it takes a lot of money to train a machine learning model. So it's probably worth for people to be able to monetize on it, even on blockchain, uh, without completely disclosing kind of like their training results, right? So in this case, we're trying to keep the model weights private. And this is the kind of the case that I want to explore today. Uh, and the idea to put things into context is think of it as a CK version of Kaggle. So for those of you who haven't um, uh, heard of what is Kaggle, uh, who are not, probably not from machine learning, uh, Kaggle is a platform, a Web2 platform, that companies can post their machine learning problems onto the platform as a bounty. And then machine learning engineers will submit their code uh, to show that they have you know, very high accuracy or very small error on certain data set. Right. So the only problem with Kaggle, um, at least its original ZK, uh, sorry, its original Web2 version, is that you have to submit all the source code uh, to this organizer before you even before you even um, uh, win anything. Right. So of course there will be regulation or some kind of agreement saying that the company wouldn't use it, but well. It's already out that out there your source code somewhere, right? So that uh, gives kind of the opportunity for CK and ZKML to kick in. Um, so CKML is actually a grant that I've done with PSE before I joined as a full time. So the idea is we want to allow machine learning engineers to submit a model that they have trained in private uh, while kind of proving their accuracy or their model performance, right? So the idea is um, a company would probably still pose a bounty and have some data set that they will share with the public that is used to train the model. Uh, and then that model would go through a lot of different libraries that um, um, either I have built or other CKML groups have built, uh, and that will turn into a CK circuit, right? So once we have that, then we are able to do um, a proof um, such that we can prove that, okay, if you run certain data through this model, here are the results you get, right? So there could be, you can score it by accuracy, you can score it by minimizing errors, but the idea is the model weights are kept private. Uh, you can commit the model um, using maybe a hash, but the model weights are private. Well, the only problem um, with when I was building this is that well, theoretically, this is a sound process, but in reality, we have a large data set, right? So we're not talking about generating one proof. Uh, we're not talking about running the model once. Typically, for a, even a minimal, very small data set, we're talking about 1,000 samples plus, right? So how do we actually are able to economically generate so many proofs um, so that like this is actually not just a POC and would practically work. So we will revisit this problem, but just so that we put into context like what are the problems that we're looking at um, in this particular application, uh, but we will revisit this when we get into the actual like practical folding.
Right. So、um, now that you have some kind of context on what is zkML,、um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the toolings that I've used to、um, perform folding.、Um, so first of all, is、uh, the tools that I've used to fold、uh, circum circuits is called Nova Scotia. Is a、um, <clears throat> sorry, is a library that been developed by Nalin from Zero X Park, and Here is kind of the schematic diagram、uh, from their、uh, repository. So the idea is that you will have some kind of a circuit that is repetitively, repetit, repetitively being run.、Um, so this step circuit is essentially a you can think of it as a black box for now, but it's a circuit that will re repeatedly run over and over again. Um, so the, each kind of like、uh, increment computation here、uh, would have a public input that goes in and a public output that goes out. And at each kind of step, you can also、uh, put in some private witness, right? So,、uh, on, so all these arrows connecting each kind of step circuit、uh, is theoretically a public output. But at the very end of like the whole process, the only public input,、uh, the, sorry, the only public signals that you can really access is the first step in, and the last public output. Okay, so why would I have to get into these details? Is because this actually comes quite um, uh, uh, becomes a crucial issue when we are trying to do folding、uh, in CKML. So again, remember that like although we are calling like each arrow that's connecting each step circuit as a public output from the previous step, at the end of the proof, all we really can access, at least from、uh, Nova Scotia, is the first public input into the whole、um, uh, folding process and the last public output. Okay, so everything in the、uh, in the intermediate process we can't really access. And so,、uh, and here is a circuit example that is taken from their repository. So every single step circuit would look somehow like this, or have similar structure, right? So at each step, you will have public signals that should be the same dimension, right? Because it's a recursive process. Your step out in the n minus one step is your step in in the, the in the nth step. Right, so the signal input and the signal output, at least for the public signals, should always have the same dimensions. You can have any private signals that you want,、uh, and then you will have some operations that is done at each step to update the step in and、uh, sorry to update the step out, of course. Right, and in this particular case,、um, you can see this example is actually performing an adding an addition. Right, so at each step you are adding to the Um, first element of the、uh, output signal, a private、uh, number, right? Private number to add to the、um, first output, and the second output is actually a、uh, a series, of,、uh, a an, an addition of the first element and the second element in the input signals, right? So, but、well, this example doesn't really have meaning. It's just to show you that, like, this is high, kind of the structure that you should do、um, when Performing this um, uh, uh, folding, and then、um, so well again, just to、uh, just to reiterate that, like only the first two inputs,、uh, only the first two signals, the step in and the step out,、uh, at, at the beginning and at the very last step is what you're gonna access、um, when you're finish the folding and have the、uh, the whole proof. Okay, so. From here, we can think of well, what's naturally we can fold, right? And if you look at the diagram,、um, if minus the private witness, right? So forget about the private witness for now. If you just think of、um, having some structure such that the data goes in in one block、uh, or one black box, spit out and goes into another black box, and spit out and goes to another black box. That actually sounds very much like machine learning, right? So immediately there is another group、um, that does 
exactly that, right? So they are turning a machine learning model uh, and trying to kind of fit a machine learning model into this process, right? And of course, not every single machine learning model would be able to do so. Um, so they kind of have to design their um, model specifically for this process as well. And that is Zater. Okay, so Zater is, uh, I actually don't know how their name got it from. Um, I think it's from the animal alligator. And this is their schematic diagram in case it's not clear that it's from the alligator, right? So the idea is, okay, the alligator has like, you know, a long uh, vertebrae and backbone. So each kind of slice of backbone is what we're trying to fold here, right? So the idea is we have a machine learning model what we're trying to do is we are trying to force the model structure to have very high repetitive architecture, right? So that means that we're not folding any model that would work on this data. We have to specifically design it such that it fits this folding scheme, right? So in particular, uh, there, there are a lot of structures, a lot of dense layer um, that are specifically all the same dimensions. Right, so from it, uh, from the at the you, in the beginning and at the end, you sort of have to have other structures so that you could get the correct dimensions. But anywhere in between, you have exactly the same model structure over and over again. Right, so if you are using kind of like a fully connected like dense layer, you have the same dimension of dense layer. Like let's say one thousand neurons, one thousand neurons, one thousand uh, one thousand neurons. Right. If we're talking about convolutional network, we have the exact same size of input and output uh, throughout, at least in the middle. And this is um, what they call the backbone dot circle, right? Uh, and then, so in this, here, in this process, we are able to fold. Um, and this, what this has allowed is that previously, model depth is actually a huge problem when you're trying to transpile machine learning models into CK. Because, you know, the longer, uh, the, the more deep your model is, the more constraints there are. And once you hit a certain number of constraints, it's pretty much impossible to run on any uh, retail machines, right? Uh, consumer grade machines, I should say. Um, so this actually solves the issue where you can pretty much run a um, 512 layer deep convolutional network on a consumer grade machine. Of course, we're talking about in the order of hours to generate a proof, but at least like it has become more, uh, it has become possible and with a reasonable proof size. Right. So um, I think one thing that I should mention by now is that the beauty of um, you know, folding uh, repetitive structure uh, using Nova is that you pretty much get like a O1 um, uh, behavior in terms of proof of time and proof size, right? So if you have the exact same structure, um, the proof that you get is essentially the same as if you're just doing one of this operation, right? So doing N operation is the same as doing one. So that's why um, they were able to kind of fit a very deep model uh, into this structure and able to get some performance uh, gain. But there's a catch, right? Because in reality, if anyone of you know uh, production grade machine learning models, no models ever looks like this. Well, in machine learning, we are dealing with statistics. And to be honest, um, that's why we almost always have kind of a funneling um, um, operation or a funneling model architecture, right? So we always go from high dimensions and we try to reduce the dimensions and extract as much signals as possible as we go through. And frankly, uh, for machine learning, from the machine learning perspective, having a model that is highly repetitive and just re remain the same dimensions over and over again uh, might not be appealing from performance or accuracy perspective. So then, uh, although this is a very appealing scheme, it might not be the most kind of practical uh, when it comes to actual machine learning, right? Like you can't really tell a Web2 company to be like, hey, you need your model to kind of look like that because it's more ZK friendly. Uh, that's actually quite hard to do, right? So 
I begin to think about like, okay, what we can do with CKML except for folding model. And that kind of begins the question of what to fold. And when you think about CKML or machine learning in general, they should be a perfect match with this NOFA folding scheme because machine learning operations are actually highly repetitive when you think about it, right? When we do convolutional network, we are applying the same filter at the, uh, convolutionally to different um, locations of a, a high dimensional image. Uh, or we, if we're talking about dense layers, we're doing like tons of uh, matrix multiplications or in a product. Or if we're talking about activation, we're applying the same function over and over again, just to like different numbers or different values inside the network, right? So there are actually a lot of possibility that you can fold in machine learning. But I think the most immediate kind of use case for me was actually doing batch inference. And that actually ties back to the, to the Zcaggle example that I was um, doing just now. Right, so revisiting this slide, I've already shown you just now in the beginning, I was talking about that if we have a data set of say 1000 samples, it's actually very difficult to be generating 1000 proof, uh, even with uh, previously uh, existing folding schemes, your, uh, your proof, like even aggregated is not gonna be that small. But now that we have Nova, actually we could essentially be proving, say, 1,000 samples, 1,000 inferences uh, with the kind of computational cost of one, All right? So we could potentially, instead of submitting 1,000 proofs, you can submit one proof that shows that, hey, this is the result from my 1,000 predictions or 1,000 inferences. So that's why the first thing that I would like to, um, you know, try to fold is batch inference. All right, so inference refers to the uh, process of pushing your data through a machine learning model and getting some kind of results. Sometimes it's called predictions, um, but in more kind of uh, machine learning terminology, it's called inference. And as I was thinking about this, at first I thought it would be a very easy process, right? Well, they already have a template. I would just plug my model into whatever that is in the middle of the operation uh, and then I would just fill in uh, the, the input signal, the output signal, and everything seems very easy. Except I immediately realized that there are certain problems. Uh, so there was actually a lot more thought process than coding uh, as I was approaching this folding problem. So uh, this, like, in case you want to follow my very rough notes of my folding kind of thought experiments, here are some notes that I've made. Uh, they're not like super tidy up. Uh, they're just kind of like really notes that I've written down um, during, during the process. Right, so folding batch inferences. The more I think about it, I realize that it's very different from our previous examples, right? So if you're, machine, if you're running a machine learning model, you really only need to assess the input data and the output data. Uh, if you are doing, for example, the summation series, you only really need to know where you started and what you get at the, uh, at the end. But folding batch inferences is actually different because we have the need to assess intermediate data. We want the result from each inference, right? We don't want just the result from the last inference. We also don't want a single number that summarize all these um, inferences, right? I don't want to sum it up I don't want a score. I want to have the actual result from each set, right? So there is a data availability or um, kind of a state management problem. And once you think about that, I think anyone who is in ZK immediately will think of Merkle tree, right? If you want to prove that your data is in you know, a, uh, if you want to represent your data with a single number, well, you just put it in a Merkle tree and use the root, right? And that's instinctively my first attempt as well. And uh, I find out that the naive inclusion proof actually will not work, right? Because when we are saying that we're doing an inclusion proof, um, it's actually agnostic to what position you're proving. 
right? So unless you kind of also start enforcing the position, which again becomes a problem. Uh, so if you just do like naive inclusion proof, essentially you can get 1000 proof of proving the same thing. Um, so that wouldn't work. Um, then these kind of the second uh, attempt when I was trying to think through this process is, well, we will just start with a tree with all zero leaves, right? And then we insert a new leaf at every step, right? Until we fill up the whole tree or finish uh, our, our samples. Um, so this could work, and this is actually what is currently being implemented um, in, in the repository that I'm going to share in a bit. I haven't pushed the Merkle tree scripts as I was just like finishing debugging, but this is exactly what I was doing uh, now. Um, the good thing and the bad thing about this Merkle tree approach, although it's using a lot of other, um, other protocol, actually we're not really gaining as many uh, acceleration with a Merkle tree as other approaches for several reasons. So it's cheap to prove individual on Leon chain relative to the other approach that I'm going to mention. But it's not exactly cheap if I still have to end up proving all 1,000 samples that I fit into the model, right? So in this case, because we're not having like individual users trying to prove their own data, uh, Merkle tree doesn't seem to be a very appealing uh, approach. So the second approach um, is, well, I will just do a recursive hash, right? For each step, I will take the result, I will hash it with the previous result and get a new hash. And then the, for the next step, I will hash it with the latest result again, right? And I will just get one hash at the end that represents all the data or all the results that I've got. And, sorry, hold on. Um, Technically, there are actually less constraints. Um, we can actually check the benchmark later, right? So because when we're doing Merkle proof, there is actually a lot more hashes that we're doing, um, and it expands with uh, 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 O log n with the number of leaves you have as well. And the recursive hash approach doesn't really scale with the number of examples, you have, uh, not the number of samples or the number of samples in the data set you have, right? So definitely, of course, it will have less constraint from uh, when compared to the Merkle tree approach. The problem, however, is that then we can no longer prove inclusion individually. Not only can we not prove inclusion individually, even if we are willing to supply all kind of 1,000 raw pre-image, it's also still very expensive to be proven on chain, right? Like I can have the data separately on an IPFS server, for example, an IPFS network, for example. But as long as I want to have that direct data availability on chain to prove that this hash uh, actually corresponds to all these pre-images, it becomes very expensive. And in fact, you need uh, as many as n hashes, right, in order to prove this um, uh, resulting hash. Right. So. Uh, at this point, I'm kind of stuck. I mean, the recursive hash approach theoretically could work. Uh, it's a matter of data availability. And when you actually want to verify it on chain, it becomes expensive. Uh, but this is kind of like the current approach that I'm using uh, just at the moment. I'm also aware that I think Lev was telling me that he has a repository that allows for um, assessing intermediate witnesses during the folding process. So uh, this is uh, this Moon Moon project is a fork of Nova, uh, which allows you to assess kind of intermediate witnesses. Of course, then you also go into other problems, which is if you have intermediate witnesses in your proof, then your proof size is also going to go up, right? So we again kind of like we're looping between you know trade off of having a small output or a small proof size or having data data availability which I think is constantly a problem that we are facing in CKML anyways. Uh, so here's just kind of like a short um, update on like what I'm doing in batch inference. I don't really have kind of like a, 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 the end game or end result on this front just yet. Um, the other thing that I was trying to fold is 2D convolution. 
right? So uh, if you don't know what is a convolution network, it's typically used in image recognition or image segmentation, where the approach is actually, let's say you have a 2D input, you are applying a convolutional filter onto this uh, image input and sum up and get a result, right? So your blue here, the blue uh, um, matrix will be your image, the green ma matrix will be your filter, and the purple one is kind of the output. So again, naturally, you will think that, well, this is incredibly suitable for folding. It's highly repetitive, right? You just shift one pixel and redo the same process again, and shift one pixel and redo the same process again. So it should be very suitable for folding, right? And that was my kind of naive understanding as well. Right, so convolution is repeatedly doing kind of by element matrix multiplication and then summing up the results. So should be super suitable for folding, or is it? Okay. Before I talk about why it isn't exactly, although there is some performance gain when we actually look at the numbers, uh, I would like to show you kind of some results that I have got first before I talk about like why is it the case. So benchmarking, uh, the numbers is actually not on the repository yet because I don't have like everything just check out uh, to make sure that I haven't done anything wrong. But this is the repository uh, that I've been doing, like uh, working on ongoingly for um, all the benchmarking work or all the folding work that I was trying to do on machine learning. Um, and I will make, probably make a push uh, right after this talk as well. So here comes the number. And once we see the number, I will go back to answer the question that I had for myself just now. So first of all, batch inference. Uh, you can see that I don't have the numbers for Merkle tree just yet, um, but we already actually kind of know what will happen. Uh, but still, like I will explain in a bit why. Uh, so let's first look at the recursive uh, method, right? So just to recall, the recursive method was doing just summing, uh, just hashing up all the results with the previous uh, latest hash. Okay, so uh, this is, um, well, these numbers are all relative. So really there's no need to kind of like look at the numbers by itself. It's a very simple convolutional model that is run on the MNIST data set. Um, for those of you who doesn't know what is an MNIST data set, an MNIST data set is a uh, image data set that is used, kind of a toy data set that people use to benchmark image recognition model is a 28 by 28 black and white image of handwritten digits. So zero to nine, All right? So it's a very toy example. Any model can easily get up to like 95% accuracy or even 97. So it's really just for benchmarking. And so if we do the recursive approach, um, there's definitely less con already less constraint even for the smallest Merkle tree when compared to the smallest Merkle tree. Um, and what I want to really show here is that the beauty of folding is that you can do one inference versus 100 inference. And after folding, the prover time and the verification time is uh, 01. In fact, I don't know why this is even a little faster for some reason, uh, but it's probably just a machine thing. But you can see that pretty much you gain the exact like kind of uniform performance when it comes to actual proving time and verification time. And that is reflective of the proof size as well, right? So you gain all these. Uh, so no matter you are doing one inference, 100 uh, inference, or even 1,000 inference, as long as you have enough memory to hold all the intermediate uh, incremental computation, then you can gain this performance by just having the same prover time and verification time, no matter how big your data set is. Right. Uh, and as for the Merkle tree approach, I don't have the numbers yet, just because I was still debugging. Um, uh, it's hard to get like the correct hashes with the past the curve. So the Nova uh, version of Circum actually uses a different curve than the vanilla Circum. Um, so, but the idea is that even for a two-level Merkle tree, right? So two-level Merkle tree meaning that it only holds four leaves. Uh, you already have pretty much more constraint than the recursive 
curve. Um, so uh, as a result, you can expect these numbers are all also going to be relatively uh, larger, meaning it's going to take longer compared to the recursive approach. So this is kind of like the uh, uh, as expected from what we have discussed, even just by the thought experiment. Um, so that's the result or the benchmark for batch inference. Uh, as for convolutional, it's quite interesting. So I've divided the method into naive method versus folding. Uh, so the naive method just means that I'm using folding because I want to compare the actual time, but there's only one iteration, right? So I'm just doing convolution in one big circuit uh, and then stuffing it in into a folding scheme with one iteration. So there's just one step. And that's what I call the naive approach. Versus whereas the folding approach is at each step, I'm doing a um, multiplication and getting one number out, right? So at each step, I'm doing one convolution. And immediately, uh, why did I say that naively, I would thought that folding would be incredibly suitable for convolutional network or um, convolutional filter. And, but I soon realized that not really, because when we have to do um, neural network with convolution, we actually want the whole output out, right? So again, we don't want a single number that represents the entire output. We want the actual output in its matrix form, right? So for example, if we have a uh, input data that is five by five by three, and we want to apply uh, convolution such that the output is three by three by two, I want all those three by three by two numbers because I probably want to perform other operation afterwards, right? It's just part of the neural network. I still have to do something to these three by three by two outputs. Um, so that's why uh, actually when we are folding, there is a lot of constraints that goes to having a selector circuit. Right? So which basically is telling the circuit where to put the result. Right, so for each step at the circuit, I have to fit in a three by three by two selector matrix, where essentially inside there is one number is uh, one in that uh, position is one, the rest is zero, just to be telling the circuit where you should place this output in this output matrix. And the result is that you can think of as, well, the selector here essentially is O n, right? So that's why when we are doing like a comparing a naive method versus a folding method, you can see that we are not really saving a lot of constraints per step when we are talking about small dimensions, right? So if you, we are performing a five by five by three down, down sampling to three by three by two, uh, we are only getting a very small kind of uh, acceleration or, or reduce, uh, reduction of constraints here. And actually, when it comes to proving time, it's almost the same. However, uh, we do gain performance uh, upgrade and acceleration as we move to larger um, dimensions, right? So there, even though um, it's about the same order, we are still gaining like, I don't know how much, how many percent I haven't really calculated, but we're still gaining more and more uh, efficiency when we move to larger dimensions. Right, so when we are upgrading almost like I think here is around 10 times, uh, we see a significantly less number of constraints when we're trying to fold versus, well, the naive approach. And as we move again to another order of 10, uh, you are, uh, will begin to see another kind of performance uh, gain again. Right, so this uh, 2D convolution is kind of still an experiment, but at least we are seeding some kind of benefit when it comes to using folding versus just a naive approach to do everything inside the circuit, uh, inside one circuit or one step. Um, so that is kind of the, what I have for today. Um, so it's a lot of more open questions, more than just a presentation. So I really want to see like what everyone think um, about like this project or, you know, the idea of CKML or, you know, using folding in different places. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. And if you want to access today's slide, you can go on my link tree and the first link uh, in the in the 
uh, um, in, in my link tree would be today's a lot. Sounds great. Thank you, Catherine. Mm -hmm. um, now we're going to take questions. If you want to just type in your question in text, feel free to do so, or you can request to speak. Okay, I guess everyone will be shy. Um, all right, here we go. Okay. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Thanks uh, for for the presentation. It was really really nice. Uh, I have a question. Refer to one of your benchmarking slide where you show like the the proving time across like one inference and hundred inferences, and it's like basically same or even less with like hundred inferences. I was wondering like. How is it? Is it even possible? Like in my understanding, the recursion is still like a sequential process. It's not like you cannot really parallelize under inferences. So, can you explain how how it gets to like this O n uh, O sorry O one uh, proving uh, proving time? This is kind of a little bit out of my depth, but then I can see Nalin is here, and I think he requested to speak just now. Nalin, do you want to come onto the stage for this? But uh, but just um, to put into context, I think one thing that I didn't mention was the creation time, right? So when uh, you still need to perform all the incremental computation. So at this part, when you cr are creating the proofs, uh, the individual uh, incremental proofs, you still are are need to yeah. Right, it's exactly yeah. It's still O n here, uh, but I believe that the Nova folding scheme actually compress it such that it's a uh, uh, it's O one. I think it should have a little overhead. I just I'm not sure why it's not really showing up here. But maybe Nylon would be the the better person to ask about like the the performance of Nova. Uh, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, I was, I was just looking at your repo just now. Uh, I, I think. The creation time actually includes like the sequential, like folding time as well. So like the creation time scales linearly with as much or as many steps as you're taking. But the proof time, I believe, in this table is like only referring to like the final compress or like the final uh, proof you get, and then you try to prove that. Uh, and that is like a fixed size, the size of the step or the size of like the each step circuit, the number of constraints you have in that. So that's why I think this is like the proving time stays the same. And I assume like the reduction is just like a sort of uh, like a, I, I guess, random like machine difference or something of that sort. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it. Cool. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. So practically, I guess like in terms of practical terms, you should really consider creation time plus recursive uh, fair for time plus proof time. Like those are all the things that you have to do in the in the local machine, right? So technically, maybe we should consider in, in the in the vanilla CK case, these are all the proof time, right? So really, what is O one would be the compressed verified. So it's like the cost on chain will always be the same, uh, no matter the number of inferences. Uh, I think so, but yeah. I believe we're still kind of building the on-chain verifier for it as well. So I'm not sure, like practically, how the guest cost will actually look like when it comes. But yeah, it should be. Yes, thank you, thank you, both, both of you. Yeah, maybe one more thing to add is like events where like one of the other projects we're working on is like trying to parallelize Nova much more uh, for the creation time as well. So in that case, maybe like doing more inferences or uh, like, like there would be some sort of reduction in the creation time as well, and it wouldn't just scale purely like linearly. And I think someone asked for the QR code again, so I'll put it up again. Uh, hi. So thank you for your presentation, and I want to ask. Uh, in the Merkle tree and recursive uh, part, you are trying to compress the uh, results of the, in the inferences into one, some, some, something like convenient, right? 
Uh, correct, correct. Right. And that's because, like, um, yeah, the with Nova, the input and the output, it has to be the same dimension, right? Because it's recursive. So I can't really... And it's also the, it also doesn't make sense that I maintain, like, you know, a, a, an array of 1,000, let's say, right? 1,000 elements over and over again. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm trying to represent kind of the output with one number, basically. So maybe the, uh, I, I'm thinking about... Can you try polynomial commitment instead of Merkle tree? Maybe it will be, uh, it will it will be less costly compared to uh, hashing. Yeah. Yes, that is actually uh, the 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 thinking too. But I think that we run into a problem where we have to do the opening in the circuit. Uh, uh -huh. in this case, so that is actually not efficient. I think. Uh. Right, so that that's a part that is not efficient um, in the circuit, right? But proving uh, is actually good. Uh, so basically, you try to. Why would you like to open the proof? Uh, open the, uh, I mean, do the opening in the circuit instead of just proving the. Uh, you are you are. Example for the polynomial commitment. Maybe you try. You just try to, uh, uh prove that you multiply. Uh, the turn corresponding to the every output to the final product. Uh, you know, no, I get what you mean, but the thing is, my output actually comes from the machine learning model, right? Yeah. So I guess it could work too, but then there will be a disassociation with between the machine learning model and the data. Oh, oh, sure. Uh, and, yeah. and the commitment yeah. itself. Right, so I want to show the commitment process as well, basically, right? To to have an end-to-end -end, uh, CKML, essentially the commitment process need to be proof, uh, proven. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. I understand. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your question too. Uh, anyone else, uh, you can feel free to drop question in the chat or request to speak on the stage. Oh, maybe one question I'll ask, Kathy. Um, I, I saw your, uh, like the 2D convolution, uh, like this folding ideas, this is quite interesting. Uh, but maybe one like, thought, or I, I don't have it well formed, but uh, I, I know there's like the sort of FF or convolution theorem, which can which like, a con 2D convolution into like something like a polynomial multiplication, which might be more like amenable to folding. Uh, I'm curious if you have looked at that or you have some any thoughts. Yeah, I, I have been thinking about that too. And actually, um, I'm well, it's not exactly answering your question, but I've been also thinking about like how other ZKML teams are taking the approach to go to the layer of like the computation graph um, uh, to, to uh, in, instead of like a high level like convolution, right? You're just looking at the graph operation like it's a, it's a multiplication or it's an addition. Um, so I've been thinking about like at that layer, like folding at that layer as well, which I think essentially it, it's kind of coincides with what you were saying where you're really breaking it down into um, you know, the actual kind of multiplication that is being, or the actual real, the actual operations that is being done, the underlying operations that is being done. Uh, yeah, so I think it could be possible to also create a circumversion of that to just see the performance. I think I, it will be quite interesting as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember seeing this framework called uh, Tiny Grad. I, I think I separately sent it to you as well at some point, but um, I, I think that also tries to do something similar, but for like hardware chips and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'll look into that. Nice, thanks. Oh, um, 
If no one has questions, we can wrap up the uh, session today and maybe later you talk about something. Feel free to use the uh, Learn and Share channel and tag Kathy if you have any questions that you suddenly realize you want to ask. Uh, yeah. So that will be for today. Thank you everyone joining uh, today's Learn and Share and uh, we look for you next time. And thank you, Kathy, for your great presentation. Mute I don't hear your voice. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to speak about like my project as well. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good day and good night. Bye bye. Yeah, bye. bye.